morning, Glen Abbey. Good 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 morning, Glen Abbey. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Glen Abbey's online service. From wherever you're tuning in today, I hope you find yourself encouraged in your faith built up by words of truth, both as we sing them together and as we hear them taught. We're looking forward to hearing from Stephen Keeve today as he continues the I Am series. Jesus said, I am the gate. And Stephen's going to help us understand what exactly Jesus was claiming when he said it, and also how this statement affects our lives today. So a week ago or so, the Burnsides invited my family, along with their Auntie Ruth, over for lunch. And I sense they were so kind to us, I said they could feature in our kids' song this week. It was very good of me, wasn't it? I am delighted to have their company today as we sing along to a kids song that you're all going to know very well. And while I'm talking about kids, I am absolutely delighted to announce the arrival of baby Jonah into the Massey family. Jonah was born on Thursday the 9th of July and William, Ashley and little Olivia are now happily adjusting to life as a family of four. William and Ashley, as your church family, we extend our congratulations to you all and pray that God will fill your home with faith and hope and love as you grow together. In Psalm 47, verses 6 and 7, we read, Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. Stevie, Corey and Heather will be leading us in our songs of praise this morning. And I want to say a big thank you to them in advance because I'm sure that they will, as they have been doing for months, they will encourage us to lift our voices high, to make the name of our God great. Let's join together now and sing.
Stadium of Socially Distanced Football and, and <laughs> well it was mostly friendly but now we're ready to have a good sing song and we hope that you'll be happy to join in with us so Janet take it away This is a light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This is a light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This is a light of mine As we come to pray together, we want to send our love, support, sympathy and prayers to the Sterling family following the death of Jonathan Sterling earlier this week. Jonathan was one of our members and he had lived with terminal cancer over the past six years. He set an example to us on how to lean in on God in the midst of our troubles. Jonathan will be greatly missed amongst us not least for his big smile and his ability to make you feel comfortable as soon as you met him, or his pastoral, caring leadership in one of our home groups alongside Colleen, his support of and engagement with missions, and his obvious love and enjoyment of life. If you are unable to watch the service of celebration on Friday or you would like to do this, it is available to watch on the Glen Abbey website and app with a link to a book of remembrance where you can leave a message for the family. We have also given a link to the conversation Jonathan had with myself last summer when we discussed Psalm 23 and he talked about his journey of faith and living with a terminal prognosis. Just click on the connect tab and you will see the link to that particular conversation. Let's take time this morning to pray together. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence this morning and acknowledge you as our God, the one who is sovereign over all things, the one in whom we put our trust. We thank you for your word that reminds us that those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And we thank you that you are our refuge, our fortress, our God in whom we put our trust. Thank you for your great love for us, which you demonstrated by sending your son, Jesus, into this world to pay the price for our sin, our disobedience, our rebellion. Thank you that he willingly entered into this world in human form, lived his life and experienced life in its fullness. Thank you for his willingness to go to the cross and die for us, taking on the punishment we deserved. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that anyone who believes and receives your gift of salvation, you promise forgiveness and eternal life. Lord, we have so much to thank you for. In a world with so much uncertainty and confusion over what we should do as we come out of lockdown with the natural concerns we have for the safety of our loved ones, we want to say this morning that we are standing on you, our rock, our firm foundation knowing that your word is truth and that we can stand firm because you are faithful and you will fulfill all of your promises to us. Guide us, lead us, help us to be wise in how we navigate through these difficult and strange days. Today as we come to you in prayer we are mindful of those in our church family who are struggling. We pray for those struggling with illness, in particular, Lord, we pray for the Vogan family in Loja, Ecuador, who are currently struggling with the symptoms of COVID-19. We are aware of the wonderful work they have been 
and continue to do, providing food parcels to needy families and sharing the good news of the gospel to those they help. Lord, we pray that they would know your healing and restorative touch and that you would be with them at this time. Each of us are aware of family and friends who are struggling with ill health, terminal illness, dementia, waiting for treatment, waiting on results, uncertainty about the future. And we ask that you would draw close and that the promise to be always with us, no matter our circumstances, would be experienced in their lives and situations. May they have a sense of your loving arms around them. Help them to bring all their concerns to you in prayer and may they experience your peace. We pray also for those who are concerned about the impact of lockdown on their jobs and longer term security. Lord, we don't know what the future holds, but we know that you go before us. And so we pray that those who are concerned or fearful would know that even as you care for the birds in the sky, so you care much more for us. May we as your church support those around us in their difficult times to bring strength and hope and help into their situations. Lord, we pray also for those who have lost a loved one in the past few months and recognise how difficult that has been with restrictions on visiting and even on how we conduct a funeral service. It's been difficult and we pray that each family would know your peace, presence and comfort. Today we think especially of the Sterling family for Colleen, Patrick and Amy, Claire and Johnny, Michael for his brother David and wife B, and the rest of the family circle. We pray that as they grieve they would know your comfort and be reminded of the living hope we have in Jesus Christ. We pray for his close friends and so many in Glen Abbey who loved him and were impacted by him. Lord help us to look to you at this time and find our hope in the truth of your word. As Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. We thank you this morning for the hope we have in life and in death because of Jesus. Help us not to lose sight of this hope in the struggles that we can often face in our lives. Help us to put our full trust in you. We pray as we worship you this morning, you will fill our hearts with wonder and praise and that our worship would be acceptable to you. We love you, Lord. And so now we lift our voices again in praise to you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
us from your love that never fails. John chapter 9, 13 to 23. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day in which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he now can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. John chapter 10 verses 1 to 10. Very truly I tell you Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by a gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it to the full. I'm pretty sure most of us have heard jokes about the pearly gates. You know the ones I mean where people die and arrive allegedly at the gates of heaven to be met by St Peter who invariably sets them some kind of test that they have to pass before they get in. I'd tell one of those jokes but I couldn't find any that didn't offend somebody, whether it's a lawyer or an accountant or a priest or a blonde or a teenager. You know how it goes. Anyhow, the point is that it represents how many people think about what happens after we die. And it's common to many religions. There's just the hope that somehow it will all be okay and that we'll be admitted to whatever our version of paradise happens to be. Well, enter Jesus. And if we listen to him carefully, he blows that notion apart because he actually announces that real life or eternal life or everlasting life has already been ushered in and it comes through faith in him. It's not about merely getting to the end and hoping that everything will be okay. Jesus says it's something available right here and right now. The verse that, that basically sums up all of the Gospel of John and, and the verse that most of us know so well, John 3.16, goes to the heart of it. It says, have eternal life right now. In fact, if you look at the rest of this gospel, it tells us more. Jesus tells the woman in the well in John chapter 4 that she can have living water right now. 
I am the bread of life means no more hunger from right now. I am the light of the world means walking in that light right now. And as we get to the I am for today, we find exactly the same. And the reason I started talking about the pearly gates of heaven is because Jesus announced, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. And then he says, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Real life, true life, full life and right now. And yes, sure, there's a glorious eternity ahead, but Jesus is offering much more. And it starts now and he himself is the gate to it. It's interesting how this statement actually arose. And I'd like us to have a look at the immediate context. But there's also the context for the first readers of this gospel. It was written somewhere near the end of the first century for an emerging church to help them with some of the issues they were confronting. And then, of course, there's our context today. What is it saying to us in 2020? So in the next few minutes, let's see what we can learn as we apply this I am the gate to the three situations or the three contexts. We can't be 100% sure of the timing because John's gospel wasn't all written chronologically. But it looks like chapters 7, 8, 9 and 10 were mainly centred around two major Jewish feasts in Jerusalem. The Feast of Tabernacles and then the Feast of Dedication or Hanukkah. The events of chapters 9 and 10 likely happened in the run-up to this Feast of Dedication when lots of people were around the city and it was a hugely significant time for the religious life of the Jewish people. In chapter 7 and 8 around the Feast of Tabernacles, well, Jesus had already caused quite a stir with the religious leaders. And now in, in this next episode, he was going to take it to another level. The story starts in chapter 9 with Jesus healing a blind man and it caused no end of controversy because it was on a Sabbath. Well, the Pharisees were incensed by this. And as well as going after Jesus, they decided to attack the man himself and even his parents. John 9.22 tells us that they had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Well, that was more than enough for the man's parents not to get involved. They said, well, he's old enough, ask him your, yourselves. And when they kept badgering the man and got more than they bargained for, as he said, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Well, that was the final straw. And they basically screamed at him, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. You see, they had decided that they were the guardians of truth. They would decide who was in and who was out. And it is right in the middle of this developing story that Jesus stands up and makes his statement. And notice that the chapter 10 verse 1 tells us that he aimed it directly at the Pharisees. As they're approaching one of their most significant feasts, where I guess they would want to be in the limelight and, and the centre of attention, Jesus tells them, I am the gate. You're not the ones who decide who comes to God, who is worthy of being in. I do that. No one comes into the life God wants to give through you. They come through me. You may think you have the power to put out or let into the circle, but you don't. That power all resides in me. And Jesus' use of that phrase, I, I am, was even more powerful. Because in using it, 
he was aligning himself with the name of God that the Pharisees so revered they wouldn't even dare speak it. And whilst I don't want to steal any thunder from next week's talk, it's impossible to ignore the other I am here, and especially the strength of its condemnation of the Pharisees, because Jesus called himself the Good Shepherd, the one who would truly lead his people, as opposed to those he classed as thieves, whose only aim was to kill and destroy. Jesus was offering himself as the true way to life, whilst all they had to offer was a dead religion, typified, I suppose, by the way they treated the blind man who had been healed. And I have to ask myself, how could it have got to this point? How could their interpretation of God's good law give rise to a situation where they would throw a person out because what happened didn't fit their system? And of course, on an even larger scale, how could they have missed the obvious signs pointing to the reality of Messiah in their midst? They, they thought they were the experts in the Old Testament and yet they were missing the obvious clues. Think of, of those verses in Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and, listen, recovery of sight for the blind. The problem is when you have already set yourself to refuse to believe then nothing will convince you, not even really obvious signs. This conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees didn't stop, however. And that brings us to the second context that I think we should consider. This gospel was written for an early church who were dealing with a very specific set of challenges as the first century neared its end. On the one hand, they faced a continuation of the same struggle Jesus had with the Jewish authorities. And on the other, there was a totally different challenge. These new Christians were often from a Jewish background, and, and we saw it even in our last series in Philippians, that conflicts were regular with the Jewish authorities, and even from Jewish Christians, who struggled to accept that you could be truly the people of God without adhering to full Jewish regulations and customs. And often the conflict was really sharp. I mean, if you think about the example of Paul himself and how he behaved before he encountered Christ, you can see that it, it was pretty serious. I actually came across some first century Jewish statements that might help us to understand how difficult the situation was. There were a series of what was called um, benedictions, um, although it's a complete misnomer, and there were 18 of these benedictions. One of them was called the benediction of the heretics. And it goes like this. For the apostates, let there be no hope and let the arrogant government be speedily uprooted in our days. Let the Nazarenes, the followers of Jesus, and the heretics be destroyed in a moment. And let them be blotted out of the book of life. You, you can see why I don't think it's a benediction. But you can also see how strong it is and how stiff the opposition was to the early church. I wonder if, if maybe we underestimate just how big a challenge this was. We need to remember that, that in the Roman Empire, the Jews themselves were already under pressure. And now these Christians from Jewish backgrounds found themselves having to take a stand against their own families, their friends and likely their work colleagues. The synagogues of which they were part were, were, were pushing them aside and even those synagogues themselves were falling apart. And the temple in Jerusalem had already been destroyed. 
all the old ways were crumbling. And so for, for these Christians in a, in a difficult place, it was vital that they would hear this message from the writer of the gospel and remember that their new life was guaranteed in Jesus. They had entered through him as the gate into their new life and they were secure in him. I guess even the blind man in our story in chapter 9 can act as a great illustration or a great example of what it means to stand firm in the face of attacks from the Jewish leaders. Despite their threats and, and despite even the weakness of his own parents, his own family not even standing up for him, he stood firm and he gave the first century Christians a great example to follow. But as well as the Jewish challenge, the early Christians faced another totally different reality. And, and maybe a great illustration of it is the example of Paul in Athens when he rock, walked around the city and he discovered statues to hundreds of gods. For that really represented their world. The Greek and Roman empires had a plethora of gods. Even the Roman emperors viewed themselves as gods. There were many ideologies, many faiths, many ways to salvation, many ideas offering enlightenment. So as well as encouraging this early church as they faced an attack from their Jewish background, the writer was also to get across to them this serious point about the truth of their gospel. Jesus is not just another one of the available options. He is the one and only, the only gate to life and salvation. And even if we think about these examples in John chapters 9 and 10, the options are quite stark and the contrasts are drawn very clearly. It's blindness or sight. It's a thief or a shepherd. It's death or life. It's very black and white. And so in the face of a very multiple choice society, this baby church was needing to set out their stall. There may be many cults and philosophies, many so-called messiahs offering themselves as heroes, but none of them will enter by the gate. They are thieves and robbers. There is only one gate. There is only one shepherd. There is only one way to full life. And there is only one flock to be gathered from all nations. Anyone else who claims to be a mediator of God's salvation is targeted here. Judaism was littered with false messiahs and the pagan world had many redeemer gods. The Pharisees even had claimed that they held the keys of the kingdom. Well, this early church had to keep their focus on Jesus, the one true gate to God, the way and the truth and the life. It's pretty strong stuff, but they needed to be encouraged to stand firm. And if it was strong stuff then, it's no less strong today. And that brings us to the final context that we need to address. What does this mean to us today? For we live under some real pressures. Some of the pressure goes a bit like this, where the world says, oh, you don't want to be part of a sheep pen. It's too restrictive. Get out there and enjoy yourself. Those rules are just God's way of spoiling your fun. You know better. You're modern people and you're fit to make your own minds up. Those rules may have been all well and good in, in another day and age, but thankfully we are more advanced now. And we too have many gods today, but mainly the God of self. And perhaps many people exist just to satisfy their own desires and follow their own ideas. And so in a culture like this, to say that true life is only found in one religion is not just acceptable. And even to take any religion so seriously that you would let it dictate your behaviour and your lifestyle appears to many people to be ridiculous. So if the Pharisees in their day offered religion, then perhaps our worldly philosophies today offer rebellion. 
And wasn't that Satan's earliest tactic? You remember in the garden? Did God really say that? Did God really mean that? Sure, he just wants to stop you being fulfilled as yourself. So what does this I am the gate say to us? Well, on one hand, it does give us security. The image of the sheep pen is one of safety. And the shepherd sometimes literally was the gate. He would lie across the entrance and act as a gateway, making sure that the sheep couldn't escape to danger on their own, but also making sure that wild animals couldn't come in to attack them. So there's certainly a message of security for us, especially as we live in what can be a scary world, knowing that in Jesus our lives and our futures are secure. But I wonder, do we maybe ignore a small phrase in the chapter? Because Jesus doesn't just lead us in to safety. He leads us in and out. Our calling is not to hide in our Christian sheep pens or, or our church ghettos, but to get out and to encounter the world. Indeed, Jesus seems to suggest that that's part of finding pasture. That's part of what healthy growth looks like. Jesus is the gate who says that we're also made for the world and we can go out into it under his leading. But it's still an exclusive message. And it's still as strong today as it was for the early church back in the first century. Still as black and white with no negotiation. There is no room to tolerate an alternative. And that's an especially difficult message to give and to stick to in a day when tolerance is almost trumpeted to be the highest virtue. You know, well, as long as it doesn't do anyone any harm, then you can do what you want and believe what you want. But, but that doesn't wash. John Tyson is an Australian pastor who, who works in New York and he's a wonderful speaker. But he said this, tolerance can only be the supreme virtue in a society which has lost the will and the means to distinguish right from wrong truth from error. Get that again. Tolerance can only be the supreme virtue in a society which has lost the will and the means to distinguish right from wrong, truth from error. If we go back to Satan's challenge, if God is God, and if we believe that the Bible is his living word to us, then yes, he did really say it, and he did really mean it. I'm sure there'll be much more said about this next week. But going back to John 10, that's really what it boils down to. Jesus said his people would know his voice. They would recognise it. In the Hebrew mindset, to know something wasn't just to have some facts about something or some acquaintance with something. It was to enter into a relationship. It speaks of intimacy. Jesus says his true flock know his voice because they're in relationship with him and they recognize his voice so only if we know his word and accept his truth will we recognize what is false he also said he would lead his flock in and out again it will only happen as we know his voice and he will not lead us into trouble or into error when we hear someone say something like, oh, God told them to do this and yet it contradicts his word, then we can know that it's out of sync. There's something wrong. And the final thing that Jesus promised, if we're hearing his voice and being led by his truth, it will lead us to real life. And that's not just pie in the sky when we die, but life to the full right here right now and sure that was the whole purpose of this gospel being written john 20 verse 31 it says these are written that you may believe that jesus is the messiah the son of god and that by believing you may have life in his name 
No doubt in this series we'll soon cover Jesus' claim to be the resurrection and the life. That's a great reminder that Christian existence is life before death, not something we merely wait for at the end, but the principle of life in the present in union with the Lord who conquered, conquered death, which means that death cannot touch our life. He really is the gateway to true life. And he's the only one.
Father God, we are so thankful for the promise of life that Jesus brings. We do look forward to a glorious future, but we also thank you that the life you bring in Jesus is life before death and it can't be touched by death. Thank you for the security assured by Jesus for now and eternity. But thank you also that the life of Christ in us enables us to play our part in this world under his leadership, despite the challenges that the world brings. Help us as we engage with the world around us to bring the exclusive message of salvation in Christ, but in a way that is gracious and graceful. Remembering that Jesus himself said he came to save and not to condemn. And help us to be faithful to him as Lord in a world where many voices call for our loyalty. Help us to listen for his voice and be prepared to obey even when the world thinks we're mad. Help us to know your word and to surrender to it. Trusting that in doing that, you will fulfil your promise of life to the full. And we ask it all in the great name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>